Okay, so uh, the next section here, uh, we're going to be talking about probably the most important probability distribution that uh, you will ever come across, which is the Gaussian distribution. So um, as he says, he's going to talk about um, probability distributions, there's a bunch of them in chapter two, um, but he's going to introduce um, the Gaussian distribution here just because it's so useful and to kind of demonstrate a couple of its properties. Um, the section is uh, pretty straightforward, except for a really interesting discussion um, about maximum likelihood estimation and the biases that it can introduce, and a really nice example of how that comes about to kind of give, give some intuition for why that happens um, that will that will kind of linger on a little bit. Okay, so um, yeah, so here it is. So here is the um, the normal distribution. So it's giving a probability to a data point x, and the distribution is parameterized by two parameters, mu and sigma squared. And we're gonna uh, we're gonna see what uh, what these things are momentarily. Um, but they specify a distribution. Uh, the mu parameter is called the mean. We'll see why it's called that in a bit. And sigma squared is called the variance. Um, often we'll work with the square root of the variance, which is just sigma, and that's called the um, standard deviation. And this comes up actually uh, sometimes too, where you know, in in some settings, for example, later on in you know in Kalman filters and things like that, it's sometimes easier to work with the inverse of the variance, and that, uh, for you know obvious reasons, is called the precision. So just a little bit of terminology here. Um, the first couple of things we're going to talk about, just just check, is that the, this this function here actually does satisfy. Um, the, prob the properties we need of, an, of a probability distribution. So first, the fact that it's greater than zero, and that's the case because this term here is all positive, um, and the exponential is always positive as well, so for, for finite um, inputs. So this whole thing is positive, and it passes the first test. Um, and then the, the second point is just to check that it normalizes uh, to one. So it's got the two basic properties, and so um, we have that it's the probability distribution. Here's kind of what it looks like. So here's you know standard bell curve with a mean at mu and a width of uh, two sigma. So you've probably seen this a million times before. It's just the bell curve, um, but here it is just to be just for completion. Okay, so now we're going to take a couple of expectations of um, of this probability distribution to see kind of you know how it behaves. Um, and there's a couple of exercises on this where you can work it out. It's pretty easy for the for a um, normal distribution. Um, the first thing is that it's expectation of uh, x, so is mu. So that kind of confirms why we call the mu parameter the mean. So if you take the average of a variable with respect to this probability distribution, with respect to the normal, with mu and sigma squared as the parameters, well, that expectation is going to come out to be mu. So it kind of makes sense to call mu the mean. Um, now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to compute x squared. The reason why we're going to be doing that is because we're going to be combining this with this and a couple lines down to, to get the variance. Um, but again, if you, if you compute just the expectation, you'll find that it's mu squared plus sigma squared. And so using this very useful formula for the variance that we talked about last time, um, we find that um, the variance of a random variable x that's distributed according to the normal distribution with parameters mu and sigma squared is sigma squared. So that's why we call um, sigma squared the variance, because uh, just simply because of that. Now, um, so it says the next thing that the maximum of a distribution is the mode. Um, and for many distributions, that maximum doesn't have to equal, you know, it will have a complicated relationship with the mean. But for the Gaussian, the mode and the mean are the same. So that's kind of another very useful property. And you can see that here. So the mean here is lined up with uh, the maximum value. And that, that's going to be useful in all sorts of settings. Okay, so then this next section is just extending the, the one-dimensional case we've been looking at to the n-dimensional case. And so there we replace the mean scalar value with the mean vector. Um, and then we replace the variance. You know, so we had, we had a, let's go back up here. We had a one over sigma squared showing up, so a precision or one over the variance. Well, now um, we replace that with the inverse of a covariance matrix. And I'm sure we'll talk about this later, um, but you know, hidden in this inverse is actually, um, if you switch to the right coordinates, you actually get a bunch of um, you know, one over sigma squareds, so one for each of the dimensions. So that's basically what this is. And in, in the kind of normalizing constant, you notice that the two pi is now being raised to the dimension, to the, to the half. Uh, 
Um, and instead of having the you know, sigma squared under a square root or just sigma squared by itself, we now have the determinant of sigma uh, to the power of 1 half. And this determinant uh, is just the product of the variances along each dimension. So you can check that you know, when you're in one dimension, this actually works properly as well. Okay, so this is going to be really, really important everywhere. So it's just really good to see this. Um, we're probably going to be talking about it in chapter two um, as well in, in detail, but it's just good to come across it now. Okay, um, so now we come to the kind of the in one interesting application of these ideas connected to um, the idea of uh, you know estimating these parameters, so kind of doing um, parameter estimation. So uh, the way he introduces it is. He says, well, let's suppose we have n data points, and he packs them into this new variable x, which is to say that this isn't like a normal vector per se. It's, it's, so it's not you know, one sample of um, the vector-valued function. It's actually um, n different samples of a scalar value. So you get, you know, just like you're, if you're flipping coins, here you're not flipping coins, you have kind of real values. You get a bunch of real values, and you're interested in, and importantly, they're um, independently distributed, so each one, what you know, that your previous samples don't determine anything about your current sample. Really, the samples are kind of independent from this, and but they're all coming from the same distribution. So that's what the, what they all have in common. They all come from the same distribution. Um, yeah, and so now the idea is to to use these samples that you have to try to estimate what the mean and the sigma squared are. So you're told that it's coming from a normal distribution with unknown mean and sigma squared, unknown mean and variance, and you want to estimate those parameters. So you know, as we said, they're, importantly, they're independent, identically distributed. So one way to do this is the method of what's called maximum likelihood. So what you do is you compute the probability of having observed uh, of the probability of having observed those samples given mu and sigma squared. And so because the samples are independent and identically distributed, um, the probability of, the, of you know, your n samples is 1, the product of the samples, the product of the probabilities of each sample. So that's where this, this, this product term comes from. That's where this product comes from. That's from the independence property. And the identically distributed means that you just use the same normal distribution with mu and sigma squared, but you plug in um, the, different, uh, the different data points. And so now we can kind of we can view this thing as a likelihood function for mu and sigma squared. And so the idea is then to go and try to adjust mu and sigma squared to try to maximize uh, this overall probability. And there's a there's a kind of a figure here that describes that. So and it's it, it's kind of important to to understand what's happening here. So what we have is we have on the x-axis we have a bunch of data points. So these are our samples. And we might have, you know, whatever, six, seven, ten samples. And now we've got these blue dots. What are these blue dots? Well, for every value of mu and sigma squared, we can assign to each one of these, um, these samples its corresponding probability. So our samples here always stay fixed, but as we change mu and sigma squared, this red curve, uh, this red distribution, moves around. And your the overall likelihood is the product of these heights, these probabilities. So you're essentially moving this, this bell curve in such a way and to, to, to find the location where the product of these probabilities um, are the highest. So you can imagine like, you know, if the bell curve was over here, then most of the, those, um, those data points would get very low probabilities. And same thing if it was over there. So you kind of have to, you kind of want it to sit, you know, sort of on top of, your, um, on top of your samples. And you do that by adjusting mu and sigma squared. So that's kind of pictorially, um, you know, how um, how we do it. Um, yeah, and actually, it makes an interesting point here that you know, based on what we were talking about before in previous parts, it might make more sense to to maximize the probability of the parameters given the data. Uh, that's called maximum a posteriori distribution. So you have maybe you have some knowledge of what uh, mu and sigma squared are, and then you update that knowledge with your samples to get a posterior distribution, and you maximize that. But for now, we're just going to stick with this um, with maximum likelihood, uh, just to see kind of how that plays out, and to highlight one of the problems that can occur with it. Okay, so how are we going to actually do that? Well, uh, as I just mentioned, the idea is to maximize this probability over, over mu and sigma squared. 
So, and you can just kind of go ahead and multiply it out. It's almost always um, easier to work with the logarithm. So in many settings, we won't be working with the probabilities themselves. We will work with the, with the sum of the log probabilities. And the reason why we can do that is because the logarithm is monotonically increasing. So the maximum of that function, um, the, the location of the maximum of a function will be the same as the location of the maximum of the logarithm of that function. And so it'll be much easier to work with, uh, with the logarithms. Um, and then he also mentions that another interesting point that comes up kind of numerically is that um, if you actually end up you know, wanting to maximize this you know, on a computer, well, if you multiply the probabilities together, you're going to get you know, very small numbers. Remember, the probabilities are all between 0 and 1. And so if you have you know, 100 of them, most of them are going to be very close to 0. You multiply them together, basically, you're going to, become, you're going to land at 0 to numerical precision. So it's much uh, to avoid what's, what's called underflow. This idea that um, you know when you multiply small numbers, they, you start getting below machine precision. It's uh, often useful to switch to use, using logarithms, and then you just end up adding um, a bunch of numbers. And you know when the number is very negative, then you'll just get you know minus 15, minus 16, very reasonable numbers that you can add up, and then convert back to probabilities if you need to. So that's what we're going to do. So here is um, the log of the the probability of the data. So the likelihood of these parameters. Um, or the you know the conditional probability of the data given those parameters. Two ways of looking at it. So now we're going to how are we going to find those parameters? How are we going to kind of you know numerically or analytically perform that shifting around um, of the of that um, bell curve? Well, what, what we're going to do is we're just going to uh, compute the derivatives of this function as a function of sigma squared um, and mu and set those to zero and um, and try to you know figure out to get an expression for mu and sigma squared. And often, in many settings, these, you know, those expressions will be kind of quite complicated, but for the Gaussian, um, in this setting, they're actually really simple and quite intuitive. So we find that you know, our maximum likelihood estimate of the mean parameter actually ends up just being the sample mean. So it's called the sample mean because we take our samples and we compute their average. So the maximum likelihood estimate of, of the mean uh, for, of your, from your samples is just the sample mean. Um, and now this, the, the maximum likelihood estimate of the variance is the sample variance. So you, you, look at, you look at what we're doing here. So we're taking each point, and now we're subtracting from it this, this sample mean that we computed, and then taking the average of those and scoring it. So it's, almost, you're, you're, it's just like the same calculation you would do with, with the variance, except for the mean parameter that you need, you put in the mean that you've computed from your sample. Okay, and this is, this is the, the maximum likelihood estimate. Now, what's interesting about this is that you can now, those are some numbers that come out, um, but now you can look at you know, how, you know, how good are those estimates? How close are they um, to the true values? Um, do they have, are they, you know, um, do they particularly tend to fall on one side or the other? And so there's this notion of bias, which is the expected, which is the difference between your estimate, the, expe the expected difference between your, um, your true, true parameter and your estimate. Now it turns out that for the, the sample mean, the expected value of the sample mean over different data sets is actually equal to um, the, the, true, the, the true mean. So the, the sample mean estimator is, you know, the estimator, which is, which is how we go from a sample to an estimate of, of a parameter, um, that's unbiased. So if we, if we look at, you know, subtract mu from this, we'll see that it's zero. So the difference, you know, on, on average, the expected difference between our sample estimate and the true value is zero for the sample mean. However, for the um, for the variance, our estimate of the variance, the sigma squared maximum likelihood, it's actually not quite the true uh, sigma squared. It's not quite the true variance. It actually undershoots it a bit. You can see by n minus one over n. So when n is small, this undershoot can actually be quite large. As n goes, you know, becomes larger and larger, this, this factor becomes smaller and smaller. But for small values of n, um, you undershoot it. And the question is, you know, why does this happen? And there's actually a really interesting uh, picture that he puts up to, to describe this, and that's, it's over here. Um, and the point is that the reason why it happens is, you remember that when you were computing the, the sample variance, we had to use, we needed a mean value, right? So we're, because vari the variances always look at the expectation squared of your, of your data point from a mean. So which mean did we use for our estimator? Well, we used the sample mean. And it turns out that um, 
when you do that, you actually end up thinking the distribution is a lot tighter than it is. And so here's kind of an example of, um, of what that could look like. So we've got, in each case, we've got, you know, imagine having three different data sets. In each case, we've got, we've, we've sampled two points, and now we compute the variance. Now the true mean is over here, and the variance is much larger, but the sample mean that we use for our samples actually ends up being over here. So the variance that we, we end up computing will just tend to be a little bit tighter because you will compute the mean, you will think that the mean that of your data is the mean of your, of your data points. So for example, for these two data points, you will think the mean is over here, and you're like, oh, look, the data is pretty tight around, you know, around uh, those points. You know, similarly over here, it, here it just happens that the, the, the sample mean is equal to the, the true mean, um, but it will almost never be the case. And over here, you'll see that, okay, and again, the sample mean is now farther out. So the fact that you use a sample mean is kind of giving you a slightly tighter estimate of the variance um, than, than the truth. And that's why you get this, um, this factor of n minus 1 over n uh, showing up. So it's because you're, using, because you're using the sample mean up here instead of the, you know, the, the true mean, which you don't know. So uh, you know, based on this, then you can say, well, if this is the, if this is the actual, um, you know, the, this, is, this is the biased estimate I have of uh, of the variance. Well, I can come up with an unbiased estimate by taking this, you know, this maximum likelihood estimate and just multiplying it by, you know, n n over n minus one. So you just essentially just scale that estimate by um, um, by by kind of the inverse of that biasing factor, and it just ends up being very similar computation to what you had before, but instead of dividing by n uh, you now divide by n minus 1. So the minus 1 is kind of accounting for, uh, you know, the bias that you're incurring by using the sample mean. And so this will tend to be, um, this will be the unbiased estimator. And actually, like, for example, in packages like, um, you know, like uh, in Python and NumPy, you can actually ask, it, by default, it will compute the, you know, unbiased um, variances, but you can ask it to compute the biased variances, and then those will then, you know, just use this, um, will replace n minus 1 by uh, 1 over n. So you know you'll you'll see that in you know in when you're computing variances, um, in general. Um, were there anything else that we? Yeah. So I think uh, essentially that was essentially all we want to talk about here. One thing I wanted to point out actually before we finish is a more general point. So here we saw that okay the reason why this bias was coming in was you know because you know and he's got this really nice example because we're computing these um, the variances relative to the sample mean. Now the interesting point, kind of a meta point, is that. He's demonstrating this with data sets that consist of two points. And why is that? Well, it's because if we go and look at this bias term, it'll be essentially the largest when, you know, for the smallest number of data points. Now, if you have a single data point, well, your variance is zero, so it kind of the, the, the procedure doesn't make, you know, you, um, um, you, won't, you won't have a kind of a, a meaningful sample variance to kind of compute these things with. Um, but you know, let's say let's say for two data for two data points, you now you'll have a non-zero um, you'll have a non-zero estimate of the variance, and your bias will be the largest there. So the bias in that case will be you know the expected variance you compute will be about half of the true variance. Now the reason why I'm kind of highlighting this is that this is actually generally a good approach um, to you know debugging your 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 equations and your code and all of these things, right? So imagine that the situation wasn't so simple. Then maybe you had some, you know, some other kind of bias or some other deviation showing up. Um, is almost always best practice to look, try to find a situation in which that deviation is the largest, in which the problem is as big as it possibly can be, because then it can become obvious, you know, what the important factors are. So you know, if we had, you know, if we looked at this picture with like, you know, a hundred data points, well, the variance here would look a lot like the variance there. So it wouldn't seem like we wouldn't be able to dis distinguish the, the two cases very well. So what you always want to do, it's kind of common sense, but it's, it, I think it bears, bears repeating that, you know, if you have some bug in your code, bug in your equations, bug in your analysis, try to make that bug as big as possible. Try to find a situation where that error is large as possible. And when you do that, then often, you know, the problem will kind of reveal itself. So here we would find that, you know, in this case, wow, our variance is like half of the true variance. So what's going on? Now it would, the problem would become very obvious, and then we can go and kind of try to solve it. So just kind of a general point um, uh, to keep in mind uh, about that and to kind of just keep, take forward with you. So I think that, that's, uh, that's about it. Um, and yeah, so after the next section, we're going to kind of come back to this, this, uh, the, curve, the curve fitting example that uh, he talked about earlier in the, in the section. Great, so uh, yeah, thanks for that, and uh, see you next time.